is a anecdote that my dad shared with my brother Raju Parasha. Um, in the chaos of partition, when the family had already escaped the riots for the relative safety of Missouri, um, SL got word that his trip to Paris had been approved and was determined to return to the Mayo School of Art for the paperwork he needed to leave for Paris. He boarded one of the last trains without papers or a ticket, risky at any time, but nearly suicidal in these circumstances, and was befriended by a Burmese man who, when the conductor came through, claimed they were together. He managed to get safely back to Lahore and to his office where the Chaukidar, hiding his former boss and reciting the namaz at night, finally caught his attention. Parasha Sahib, you cannot do this. It is not safe for you here. You must go back across the border. The return trip was one of terror. At every crossroads and country town, when the train slowed, they feared being boarded and, uh, boarded and massacred. This is the story that is too familiar on both sides of the border. When the train finally came to a full stop near the crossing, only the last minute arrival of the Indian Army ensured safe passage. So that is how Sardari Lal Parasha arrived into modern India, one rumpled set of clothes with a newspaper clipping of a sketch of Tagore in his pocket. Everything else has um, his artwork, his family photographs, his possessions uh, were left behind. Once here, he set about creating a new life immediately, hearing that there might be a position available as commandant of the refugee camp at Baldev Nagar Ambala, he borrowed a fresher pair of clothes uh, and uh, clambered up onto the roof of one of the packed trains going in that direction. These are stories that in the evening at the camp there are stories that in the evening at the camp, Parasha would walk around, drawing in order to relieve despair, nearly immobilized over the inability to do anything for the traumatized and grieving people all around him. Often only a few lines, sometimes on scraps and ornaments of paper. To this day, these sketches retain the sense of stopped time, frozen glimpses, of those whose lives had suddenly come to, a, come to a halt. Very few are named, dated, identified, or signed. It was not a place or a moment where the particular could take on much importance. So this talk is, uh, uh, will work through my position as SL's daughter, and thus will be generational in scope. As an interdisciplinary artist and a teacher of film and art theory and practice, I will look at embodiment and other silent registers to excavate from the received ruins of history, those themes which continue to resonate the multiplicities of modern India. While this is going to be a talk between my sister Aloka and I, I just have a few slides that I'd like to, um, you know, kind of share with you, but also talk through some of the uh, some of the slides. Forced migration over this new border in 1947 is now an epic part of our national history. But as with all histories, uh, the individual stories and most of all, the individual losses and tragedies soon get lost in the telling. Such records are scant. SL Parasha's partition line drawings and sketches are a silent hand reaching out toward us over time, out of the liminal space of Ambala refugee camp, the Baldev Nagar refugee camp, into the invisible future. His own story runs parallel to those he documented. I'm going to show you a slide of uh, SL in the Baldev, there it is, at the Baldev Nagar camp. 
To a refugee marooned on a way station of life, not only is there no, vis no way to visualize any future, but the past is wrenched from meaning. A man who knew himself to be a farmer is nobody at all without his fields. Even for those family groups who had managed to stay together, the physical loss of almost everything they owned left them lost and adrift gathered together in the camps, strangers not only to one another, but to themselves, did what they could to create some sense of community in this emptied space. The camp tumbled together in the space around a railroad station was without amenities. Inevitably, um, without amenities, without even shelter beyond uh, tents inevitably muddy in rain and dusty otherwise. Without infrastructure, the simplest matters of daily living were difficult to accomplish. SL Parash's arrival into this chaos was abrupt as every other. Only a chance encounter, um, my sister Shoba tells me, who knew him from Mayo College of Art and who recognized him as a gazetted officer offered him this position that he took on very, very, uh, with all its responsibilities. What were these responsibilities? A series of urgencies, food supplies were unreliable and sometimes unstable. Everything from housing to play equipment had to be managed creatively. Photos of him at the camp show something my eldest, uh, eldest sister, my two elder sisters, Shoba and Bela, remember, in all the crowded, hectic chaos, he looks the same, perfectly groomed in light trousers and an immaculate white shirt. Beyond the camera lens, he actually had only two sets of clothes and every evening made sure there was a fresh one ready for the next day. It was part of his responsibility as commandant, he explained to his daughters, to ensure an aura of routine and order to maintain general confidence. Oddly formal in a chaotic situation, but unruffled on the surface, whatever was going on within. Artist turned administrator, he spent his days attending to um, people's problems. Only in the evening could he stroll through the quiet at camp and allow his emotions out. Um, the drawings and sketches that you are going to see are on scraps of paper. They are evanescent as breath, a hasty record of despair where the years of artistic training funneled emotion directly into permanency. It's difficult to know if uh, now, if they were meant, if they were so, so meant. For 50 years, they lay ignored in a trunk while the new India created itself out of the ashes. I'm going to show you a series of uh, images uh, that uh, represent, um, you know, the, um, the road and a journey. So in, although the Baldev Nagar camp in, in Ambala was set beside a railway station, and certainly many of the refugees did travel by this then modern route, a more emphatic image of momentary stasis is the bullock cart. While some of the sketches are minimal, similar to many contemporary artists, the bullock carts are nearly archeological. The detail that you see in the search of a new home is complete enough for a film script. There are loving details of how the cart is made and how a large load is secured. And while these technical matters are precise, the details of family and bundles uh, are barely suggested. Even the beast himself, engine of this necessity, is represented only by, a pow by his powerful hindquarters. Like the rest of the migrant family, the poor fellow has no face. It's hard to guess why the bullock carts were so meaningful to my father. It could be a recognition of the road the refugees traveled. 
In his pencil's detail, it's not hard to imagine heavy, plodding footsteps and the squeaking, groaning joints of the wood and lashing of the cart. In the luxury of retrospection, it seems important to me that two of the sketches show animals not working but eating. I'm going to show you those two sketches. So way station and from the road. And I'm going to talk a little bit about these two. Um, if human food was often problematic, I, what I'm trying to, you know, kind of, you know, give you a sense of is how uh, he might have been thinking. And, and it's all uh, based on stories he told us and some of his writings. So under the uh, circumstances of a refugee camp, this could have had special significance. If human food was often problematic, what about fodder? The apparatus is complex, but clearly handmade. And the men? The men are tending to their stock with affection and concern of a good husbandsman in a situation where all such traditional roles were ruptured. So particularly in this image in Way Station, where the prominent angular lines suggest the cart had to be dismantled to create a manger and where the beast's face are buried in what is likely the hide of one of their predecessors, a scene, serene agricultural image displaced by politics is bleakly ominous. I'll have more to say about faces later on, but note these. Um, in the next image, which is on the road, oh, from the road, uh, think of Way Station along with From the Road. Uh, both are available to the viewer and rendered in some detail but their own focus is entirely on the animals and on the task at hand. So these are some uh, images that he drew on the, uh, about journeys, about the road. And I'll come back to the road at the end. Uh, right now, I'm gonna go into um, uh, some of his representations of um, um, of uh, people in the camp, in, in the Baldev Nagar camp. This slide, Cry, this is very beautifully said by one of uh, the right one, um, by Sandy Sterner in one of her essays. She writes about the cry. In Cry, the howling man wails that at least in part he knows his voice meets silence. It is the upper half of the man rendered in heavy strokes hairy chest, rough beard and eyebrows, top knot unraveling all dark and frantic. The open mouth cries or shouts or screams, no way to know. But his wrist bangs his forehead and his eyes too are closed. It's the idea, not the wail, caught by the artist. Catastrophe, still the subject's own. In the next slide, um, which is another, I think, has some uh, resemblance to this one, is Cheek. Both in Cry and Cheek, while these sketches appear to have been done quickly, the pencil strokes here seem even more urgent, one fist in the air, as if railing against fate, and the other almost out of frame, possibly reaching towards something already gone. The open mouth is a dark hole in the bearded face, shout coming toward us through the decades, still unanswerable. His hair and garment flow as if he were leaping or running, but his body and muscular arms also suggest a solidity. Um, I, I think um, as if the man is the only thing left to rely on, and he is indeed reliable. Like most of the sketches, it is an isolated figure. This must have been an intentional choice 
since in the relocation camp, there would have been people crowding everywhere, wrenched from everything they had previously known and deposited among strangers, the residents would have felt adrift, perhaps even erased from view. In this figure, though, we are forced to confront the bleak realities of those days. The people who made it as far as the camp knew, however unthinkable, that they were the fortunate survivors. Did they consider themselves lucky? In making it from the past to this place, each would have seen and escaped unimaginable horrors and now inescapably carries the horrors within. Not only were they witnesses to violence, but many would have lost loved ones to it. The possibility of even imagining a future must have been remote. The terrible current moment is, is all there is. The next slide, uh, Heavy Despair, is, shows what could be the same man, but this time in a different pose. The image is unlike the others in many ways. It is just as hasty and urgent, but this time in watercolor, in ink, rather than pencil. There is a background to a step or lintel where the figure is seated and the suggestion of both floor and a wall around him. While these things are available to the viewer, the subject is oblivious to them himself. The strong arms are su supporting the bowed head, possibly raking the hair or even more likely a static figure, clearly full of vigor, but marooned here unable to make any use of himself, unable to make any impact on the overwhelming events that brought him here. Poignant as this image is, it is counterpointed by others more hopeful. And the next one is interesting because it's very different from um, the ones we've seen thus far. Um, Title kind simple, uh, similar men, but this time with a sense of something like community. They sit companionably together, talking as mildly as if they were in their village home. But the lines of the tent remind us that they are not. The man in the foreground has a familiar strong body, a man in the prime of life and accustomed to work. The one on the left looks more gaunt possibly elderly or frail. Along with the top knots, these connections and the suggestion of more people in the background give the impression that this is a family or a village community and the men are deciding how best to manage. They are turned toward one another familiarly without either outrage or despair, faces open and receptive. It is said that when people find themselves in temporary situations, uh, the first thing they do is make some kind of demarcation that indicates us and ours as part of the whole, but also separate, individual, a point of recognition of that which can be maintained. There's an astonishing casual grace in company, men in a circle, the meeting could be in the most ordinary times, working people or evening leisure, their capacity to be at home anywhere is a counter theme to the distraught, isolated figures. It's almost as if he could see in their relaxed companionability the potential to sit down in one place and stand up in another to organize a new life in, and yet unseen places. Uh, in a lot of interviews and research done by those who remember partition, a recur recurring theme is the loss of community. Many of the sketches show the same thing. Bereft of everything else, Parasha's subjects reach out to one another. Um, how, are we doing for t how are we doing for time, um, Megha? Okay, well, I'm going to continue. Um, 
a place that is no place. In this, um, McPherson writes about contained figure. Man in a shawl is done in heavy lines, defined as a sculpture, but his look is away from the viewer. We are not invited in. Um, whether this containment is endurance or total despair, we are not allowed to know. We are all descendants of partition, however distantly or directly it affected our families. One of the things I find difficult to imagine is how much those who experienced it thought displacement was temporary. My father so considered himself part of Lahore that he was not that he not only left that he not only left when it seemed advisable, but immediately returned to what had to this point been his history, his home, his art school. Um, Sorry, Prajna, we're okay with time. I could not unmute myself. That's okay, not, not to worry. Just, don't, just give me a warning if you think I'm going overboard. Yeah, I can yeah, wrap it yeah. up easily. Sure, sure. So this is the Chaukidar, the night watchman at uh, the Baldev Nagar refugee camp. You can see it. If you can read my dad's handwriting, it says Bhagat, who is um, a chokidar at night in the Baldev Nagar refugee camp. So we we hear we heard the sto story of stripped of the horrors it must have included, and know only that that when the chokidar saw my father, his former boss, I'm relating back to the story when he goes back to Lahore and the uh, Chaukidar recites the namaz at night. So he's the one who persuaded him to uh, leave, to come back, to, uh, to leave immediately. So I didn't know that Chaukidar, of, of course, but I think of him as this one, Bhagat, who was the Chaukidar at uh, night in the Baldev Nagar camp. He's one of those resilient fellows but why is he rendered in such detail when so many of the sketches are only faint suggestions of individuality? Um, now I go on to a series of sketches and line drawings of women. Oh, and this is Braving Winter, again, like a uh, contained figure, the folds all moving towards an in uh, to, towards a center, um, all the folds wrapping, um, uh, you know, uh, wrapping the the image of and a face that just moves forward. Um, I'm going to um, uh, yes. So this is one of. I think the one we used on the um, uh, invitation, small comfort. While the figures of men often uh, contain something close to scene setting or at least bits of contextual detail, the women are isolated, isolated from place anyway. They are often in the company uh, or with one another. The many individuals have a kind of universality in the affectionate soft lines, the OG curves of their interned shapes, the nearly swaddled quality of the garments, the extreme gentleness of the images manages to accent rather than diminish the effect. The women are in despair. Not only do they have nothing, not even to sit on or against, but they have nowhere to turn to for solace. The dangers of social chaos without being mentioned, uh, evident without being mentioned. In small comfort, each figure is nearly subsumed into the larger unit. This could be a flock of birds sheltering for the night. The way they reach toward one another suggests that they are creating with their bodies the shelter available nowhere else. In uh, the next slide, uh, Confining Grief, another group scene, everyone is equally shrouded, but they are 
unusual unusually a couple of there are unusually a couple of visible faces while there are not enough details to show personality as can be seen elsewhere there is enough to show that one of the figures is young and the next old the senior figure is even revealing her bangles a detail that could carry different meaning on younger wrists would it be risky to suggest that such detail though of traditional figures comes well into the era of photography even of film in the way a close up replaces dialogue in grief has no voice one of the few instances where the women are not entirely isolated we see two side by side together but not leaning into one another and not entirely concealing their faces though both have their hands towards their heads in gestures usually meant to signify lost in thought beside them is a closed box trunk with a handle and between them a water pot a very small water pot if you consider the amount of water that must be carried i'm thinking of women's work particularly in the camp situation even marooned here the figures look vigorous and supple large hands suggesting people accustomed to work they don't cover their faces but they don't look up either something additional uh on the side is there i'm i'm sometimes i see another figure or a bundle were it not for the clear impression of forced inaction wait, waiting these two young village girls it could be anywhere at rest in the traditional posture of uh, female modesty here are a series of um, uh, compositions waiting change almost identical com um, uh, composition uh changes remarkably when the you know there's a shift here we move from the gentle pencil and it's now replaced with ink while the subjects are still not expressing outrage the artist is lines already stark black and doubled and tripled where there might be detail there is instead a frenzy of scribble giving to the figure figures not from them the buzzing background of emotion held back cries unspoken visible in all the sketches but particularly clear here is the tension of the fleeting moment the image captures and the permanently broken lives of the moment the moment represents it feels to me as if my father was feeling how his years of training as an artist were nothing to the need to record the unthinkable before his eyes although it happened before i was born i know that my two older sisters were already born at the time of partition so in some sense it seems odd that there are very few sketches of children and i just want to go through a series of uh, other line drawings and sketches of women uh, at the baldev nagar camp you notice that in the in uh, in the abstract i mentioned that uh, he was commandant of both baldev nagar refugee camp and gandhi nagar there's very little that we found from gandhi nagar but um, uh, in the next few images you will see uh other representations of women uh, at the baldev nagar camp this one is particularly interesting to me because uh it is um a grand a grandmother and uh um it also includes a child um and may predict i think for those of you who are familiar with uh sl's work and may uh predict future work where women are usually mothers here an old woman is slumped and forbidding glares at the observed observer while a child small enough to be empty of expression looks towards her 
the child is much more hastily included than the woman who looks temp bad tempered and angry rather than as close down as the many figures who do not reveal their faces. At the risk of going even further into conjectural personal biography, I'm reminded of my grandmother displaced living with us in Delhi. Um, she understood little of the new circumstances and we were somewhat, you know, we always wondered about her because the only, she, she, she was in a new land. She, she was, you know, Lahore was home to her. The only partially formed child in this particular sketch uh, will be able to adapt to the unknown world ahead. But uh, the deracinated woman she looks to uh, will not be able to help her. So I often wondered why there were fewer images of children. And I think as, as we go through the slides, I think we'll get a sense of why. I think it was very traumatic for um, SL to see the death and um, particularly the death of little children. So it, it's, a, it's a painting that I'm going to show you, but it does not, it's not something he made in the camps. It was later while he was in the art school in Simla, uh, the founder principal there, that he painted uh, the image, the road away. And that's the other road image I'm going to show you. Um, so let's go through this series of slides about women turning away. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to look at the image. Or maybe less. This particular image uh, has traces of what he will sculpt later. And in that sense, this image serves as a sketch for a later work of his refugee women. Uh, the work is currently in Washington, DC, um, but it is very reminiscent of the sculpture he will create. So everything I've heard about the camp experience and everything I know about my father suggests that he knew and responded to the, the refugees as individuals. The unfamiliar role of commandant in that way would have been somewhat like the more likely role as artist principal of an art school, what he did before and after Ambala. But as any creative person who's been maneuvered uh, into administrative work knows the artist has to be muffled while other qualities negotiate the endless problems involved in building a community from the literal ground up. So while the hectic, while the hectic days were spent solving um, urgent problems, the evenings gave my father moments to touch his deeper, more emotional response. And in this image, absence in the next image, and the following images. Uh, let me just go through uh, the images first. Um, let's pause on this one, but I will refer to the prior two images. I think the lines of these uh, sketches and the two that we just saw are dark and emphatic. Fury is in the strokes of the invisible hand drawing. 
the posture of the figures themselves reveal still powerful people, but lost in wretchedness. New independent India was an evanescent idea that had not yet, that had not happened yet. Like the suggestion of the well, and I will show you an image of which of a painting that uh, SL does later in the 50s. Um, the hunched women, uh, these presences evoke their much larger absence, the great void of their lost possibilities. One of the many things I puzzle over when I look at these sketches is why he so often obscured uh, the faces of the figures or when he drew faces at all, separated them from any context. Even when he does faces, they are not portraits. They're more like illustrations, but the stories they illustrate are all lost to us. There's no evidence that he thought of these scraps as studies or part of a larger project. Perhaps it's more like a journal. None of the subjects are engaged or even to seem to recognize that they are being recorded. With the exception of the sweeper, and I'll come to that image, they are all turned inward, focused on the lost past, we assume, the only loosely connected to the unsupportable present. Let me just show you a few of these sketches, show you the sweeper, and then um, this is interesting to me because it's obviously my sister Bela's homework. And uh, I think she's doing history here. Um, I don't have my glasses, so I can't read, but it's titled Wordless. And um, this is the painting I was referring to. You can see how even later on the OG curve, this curvilinear lines continue to be part of uh, his work. The world is pretty significant because we do know historically at least a number of women, um, you know, kind of ended their lives in wells because they could not um, face the trauma or the violence of the moment. Very recently when I was in India, um, when the Partition Museum in Amritsar opened, I was going through some more of his papers and I found a series of images uh, that surprised me because um, um, like this one, un unwinding. Um, the reason it surprised me because I think most of his sketches and line drawings have really soft lines, have people holding each other, have people, you know, in despair, crying out loud. The violence of this image was a surprising one. And I found at least eight or nine of them. I don't have the time to show all of those here, but the, it begins with a, a sketchbook rendition of a train with just bodies pouring out. And then I chose this particular image because um, it, it's, it's, um, so disconnected from the earlier ones that I've been showing you. Let me just go back to, um, uh, let me see if I can, you know, if I can go to, um, this is the other image that I said, you know, why didn't he, uh, why didn't he um, image the child? I guess it was very traumatic for him. And later on, I think this is also in the 50s. I couldn't remember the year, so I did not put it down. But I think this is in the 50s, the road away. It's a painting. Um, and you can see, um, I don't have to tell you, but the, the, the trauma of seeing children, um, women, um, older people, um, I think um, was... Perhaps one of the reasons why um, he put away most of this work in a trunk and, you know, it was much later on that uh, um, when he was um, much later on in life, he, you know, he, I, we had gone, I'd gone down to Delhi from Pittsburgh because I knew he was passing away. 
Um, and I, you know, we siblings got together and said that, you know, we've got to get him to, you know, sign some of these works and pulled out works. We, I wanted to record him. And he'd always tell me that, you know, uh, let me get stronger and then we'll do it. But, the, you know, we knew that uh, becoming stronger was uh, too far in the distance. Let me just go back. Um, tech support, can you take me back? Um, okay. I can't go. Anyway, I wanted to show you. Um, yes, this is the image I wanted to show you. This is the other only image where uh, we have a sense of uh, someone not looking towards self, but you know, looking uh, outwards. And this, this, the sweeper's nearly grotesque sm smile and the coiled but energetic body. Uh, show one kind of human response to catastrophe. We persevere. And equally vivid image suggests we don't always. And we've seen many of those images because we know that, you know, he captured, um, he captured moments of hopeless uh, privacy. Um, I want to um, kind of provide you with some kind of, you know, I'm going through a lot of his files and I found uh, this official record of him receiving the job as camp commandant at Baldev Nagar camp, Ambala and Gandhi Nagar camp in Delhi. And then I wanted to share with you his writing about the refugee camp. A lot of what I talk about is you know kind of um, echoes some of his thought and thinking this is again something i found recently uh, in his files but he talks about the camp and he talks about you know um people huddled together waiting uh being in just crying out loud and he talks about the rain the mud the flies and the constant even in the silence of the camp uh, the buzzing of flies is the loudest possible sound that everybody uh, hears. And so I rely on a lot of his, um, um, his writing uh, for my, uh, for my um, um, interpretation of what uh, some of these images uh, might mean to me, but also to um, uh, the us as viewers. Um, and this is the last uh, image. No, maybe this is not the last image, but I did want to show you this very uh, wonderful affidavit um, of um, Sardari Lal Parasha, son of Pandit Devan Chand. I, Sardari Lal Parasha, son of Pandit Devanchan, 51 years, five months of age, residing at Khad Cottage, Simla, for, do solemnly, solemnly affirm that I am a refugee from West Punjab. I was registered under refugee registration card number. I love these numbers that our government gives. 1181-1. Hyphen one one dated 2010, 1947 at Connaught Place, New Delhi, which I have lost. Um, as I sit over this document, the thing that torments uh, in the loss of his registration card is the necessary absent uh, space that requires a declaration. Uh, it is a felt absence that does not appear, or does it? swearing his refugee status, participating in the national realities that had separated him from his father's home. What, he has, what has he shown us? What my father has left us in his artworks, our witness, you know, our mute witnesses, or witnesses, because I don't think they're really mute. They keep speaking to us. His answers, he knew we, in our own turn, 
would have to spin outside the OG into the right questions. I'll end with an image of a terracotta or a, a, um, this is a piece he did uh, from the earth of Baldev Nagar um, uh, refugee camp in Ambala. He did several, two other pieces, uh, one which we only have a photograph of and one which is a memory in a letter written by my father to um, Prem Singh, who was also one of the principals of the Punjab School of Art. So um, perhaps we could open it up to questions from my sister, Aloka Parasha Sen, or uh, how would you like to uh, proceed with this, uh, Mega? Yes, I think it would be nice to have Aloka come in now. Okay, um, um, uh, after this amazing and poignant presentation by Prajna, um, I have to come in with uh, some very basic uh, questions about uh, what I thought was very familiar to me, but I think that uh, it's not yet, it's still unfamiliar. Um, especially since I deeply contemplate about uh, what she has presented to us. Um, in the beginning, uh, as growing up, uh, all of us took all this as very, you know, granted, taken for granted. And uh, one uh, looked at them and we admired them and of course father's work and we also knew about his other work. Uh, but as I said, um, it looks familiar to me, but yet unfamiliar. Um, I shall also not say that this harks back to our childhood because it does not. Our childhood was in the midst of the scenic Shimla Hills. Uh, and I remember vividly a uh, ride to school on a horse. Uh, and that's not just a simple act of taking good care of children but indeed it was a luxury. And I wondered why I was indulged in, in the way. And most importantly, neither in conversations between the elders uh, or in terms of any visuals uh, that uh, we have just seen, um, we got no inkling at all of the witness to loss in these refugee camps or what transpired before. So it was only as mature uh, grown-up individuals that we become, uh, we get to know about all this. Uh, now, I would say that, uh, I would like to suggest here that this is not unusual, of course, because uh, when we listen to narratives about partitions, most families uh, having witnessed partitions in various degrees of suffering, loss, misfortune, uh, were silent in the immediate succeeding years after the event. And, we can, we can bring up this point a little later in the discussion. Uh, but first, <clears throat> I want to, you know, sort of uh, uh, raise uh, something that Prajna has already uh, pointed out, uh, that uh, we all know that partition was a collective historical event and a collective historical experience. Uh, but what she has just described to us is an individual's documentation of part of the process of partition. Uh, and the emphasis in the, is in that part where life is saved and there is a sojourn which graphically and very uh, ably she is described uh, in the refugee camps. So what I want to raise right in the beginning um, is uh, that um, actual violence except for the image that she showed us towards the end, which is uh, more, um, which she has recently found in the collection. So actual violence is not documented, but I do believe that it is seen inherent um, in what was, uh, in the loss that was depicted. I mean, there was a loss, uh, violence is inherent in that loss, maybe perhaps another kind of violence, I suppose, of mental agony, of suffering, of uh, perhaps recollecting, many of those images may have been recollecting or forgetting, uh, re recollecting or forgetting the memory of violence. 
So uh, some of the sketches like cry, heavy despair, uh, as far as the men were concerned, and uh, the one I think anguish uh, or curled up uh, together in another place, all these images, they really are talking about violence that is inherent, that is meant uh, a kind of mental, uh, uh, something that is mentally encapsulated. So I want to you know, lay on the table a larger question, which uh, some of us can discuss, or maybe perhaps uh, Prajna can give her reactions, uh, that uh, why do some individuals uh, in this case, uh, but otherwise also societies and uh, now nations as well, remember violence or even glorify it while documenting their successes and greatness. Well, others indulge in what uh, Ashish Nandi at some place had called principled forgetfulness. Uh, so your reactions, because I mean, I think we agree that there is no explicit uh, display of the actual violence that took place, but he's a witness to a loss and inherent in that witnessing, uh, he tries to bring out the possible violence that people must have gone through. So maybe perhaps uh, you can react to this uh, and then I can bring up some more points for discussion. Yeah, I think uh, to respond to your question about um, uh, why is there uh, this focus on violence uh, in, you know, in a number of discourses. I think what he is doing is that he is looking at the fragility of uh, uh, the evidence in front of him. He is, he, as you know, he never took ownership of any of the work he did. And he does not take ownership of the violence that was enacted on the bodies of people. And which is why, this is my contention, is that I think that is why he is able to kind of um, um, uh, depict, uh, you know, represent most of the, particularly the love the sketches display for their subjects, suggest that he felt no ownership of the trauma and um, wouldn't have felt it right to make use of it. I think there is a voyeurism to violence. There's a, it's a very pornographic kind of a gaze at violence that kind of uh, Im immediately uh, can, uh, you know, um, uh, draws in um, audiences, viewers. I don't know. I mean, I'll leave it up to yeah, the- Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, that's, no, that's very interesting because, um, you know, the memory of, uh, the memory of partition is one of uh, uh, a memory that is uh, full of violence, right? Uh, I mean, uh, the photographs that you see, the documentaries that are shown, uh, and so on and so forth. So this, I uh, post this because uh, what you have presented is uh, very different uh, from what usually is uh, depicted as the violence of partition. I mean, I am suggesting that there is an inherent violence, uh, but there is also some kind of uh, thing that um, uh, as I said, Nandi calls principled forgetfulness. So the question of memory and forgetfulness is uh, something that we have to address. Now, uh, something that I want to bring up uh, um, um, uh, as a next point is that, uh, uh, and you have already mentioned it, uh, but for those participating in this conversation, um, S.L. Parashar went on to become the first principal of the Government College of Arts on the lines of the Mayo College and left behind in, uh, in Lahore. Uh, and this was first in Shimla and then later on shifted to Chandigarh. Uh, and there was a recent article that all of us have read written by uh, D.S. Kapoor, who recently retired as principal of the same college, where he gives us elaborate details of how uh, Parashar went through the task of setting up this new school of arts in Shimla. And his narration points, and of course, he also gives some really nice photographs uh, to show how people from different parts of India were invited to join this college. So what I'm um, looking at here is that uh, the despondency of the refugee camps was soon transformed to an energy to build, to construct, 
rather than to destroy. And this is in 1951, and this is barely uh, five years after uh, partition. And uh, so, so what I wanted to ask or what I wanted to place on the table is that, do we think that this focus on building uh, and positivity consciously try, is consciously making him try to forget the traumatic days, um, though, though the sketches are a memory of them, uh, but then the sketches were in trunks okay, at that point in time, or they were hidden somewhere, we don't know where they were. So do you think that this building activity, this creating of the new College of Arts and all that was uh, a kind of conscious effort to forget? Uh, and here I do believe that there is an interesting play between uh, forgetting and memorizing, is it not? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, that is like... I, 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 wanted, I want to draw your attention also to the, sculpture, the sculptures he does in the 50s and 60s. I think the tracery of the camps uh, is transferred onto his sculptures, refugee women, ragi, ref, you know, the um, uh, um, several images of the refugee woman. Um, and also his, um, the lonely pilgrim. Um, so if you look at the sculpture of the 50s and 60s, you see the tracery of the camps. Um, yeah. It is only when he uh, when he goes into the phase of making when he is uh, doing installation work murals, when Corbusier selects his design for the um, men engineering college in Chandigarh that he goes into purely abstract uh, kinds of forms. I mean, we are talking about an artist who has 10 year, 10 decades of work. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, no, no, that's good. That's good that you're, you're saying this because it's precisely the point. At one level, there's a forgetting, uh, getting involved in building. And at a level, another level, there's a, that's what I'm saying. There's an interesting play between forgetting and remembering because remembering through larger than life images, the sculptures are huge. Uh, of course, we have not seen uh, any images of that, but some of them are in the art museum and all that. Uh, but in any case, uh, this, is, this is something I thought that uh, the energy, the energizing of, the, uh, you know, sort of the contrast between the despondency of the refugee camps and something that happened just less than five years into uh, building of modern India, I suppose, become the art school uh, was one of the institutional uh, uh, works that were heralding the beginning of modern India. Uh, and um, the other thing that, um, uh, you know, uh, bothers me, <laughs> uh, I mean, and it's only because as a historian, I uh, wonder why are we remembering today? And I just wanted to ask you, so what was our first reaction? I don't, don't remember mine, but I don't know what, what yours and others. Uh, so what was our first reaction when we found these sketches? Um, and then uh, how over a period of time, especially when we were doing the retrospective of his works in 2004, how over a, over a period of time, our perception of these sketches has changed? Uh, so I do believe that from personal papers, they became public documents uh, and they are, of course, much sought after. Even while my mother was alive, there were many individuals and institutions that were wanting to use the sketches as book covers and as illustrations for books. Uh, and um, perhaps uh, some of the individuals were even, uh, even willing to buy them. So perhaps... Uh, we are now looking, perhaps, I'm just, not you and me perhaps, but others are looking at data for history writing. Uh, and this has been happening um, for the last two decades uh, since an entire branch of um, partition studies or partition archives has emerged um, everywhere in the world, in the UK, in the US, in India as well, Pakistan as well. Uh, where documenting of these human stories has become important and especially uh, the big focus on oral recordings of those who went through partition and are still living or were living at least 
a decade ago. So are we trying to resurrect historical data that it was not meant to be? And here, uh, there's a general question that historians and teachers of history have to address. Uh, and that is how should we use artistic representation or literary perceptions as historical data? Because you too suggest that this is witness to loss, but the, the transaction of that loss is through the artist's own imagination and his representation. So how do, we, how do we do that? I mean, how do we look at artistic representations as quote unquote historical data? Uh, because the, the very making of these archives, the very making, uh, I'm, I'm calling this archiving of experience. I mean, usually archives are to do with, you know, grand documents, official documents, etc. So I'm sort of raising this whole question for anybody in the audience, but maybe perhaps you can also react to it. Maybe it might be nice if there's a question from the audience uh, or if there's a curiosity or if there is a response. Yeah, anybody. Anybody yeah. can. Otherwise, my sister and I can go on for hours. Um, anybody I, I, could, anybody yeah. could address that, those historians amongst us, uh, whether, whether one, I mean, you know, this kind of uh, documentation that we have and especially since you pointed out that this, uh, uh, the illustrations are on fragments of paper, there is the fragility not only of the perception but also of the very document. What if they'd all been lost uh, and therefore dissipated and we don't have anything? I mean, compared to authentic sources of information in official archives or even in the more recent oral narratives, uh, this is a fundamental question because there's a lot of this recording going on and basically what we are doing now is archiving experience, isn't it? So how should a historian or a school teacher or because I mean Megha is very interested in the pedagogy of how this should be transmitted to another generation. I think that we need to address this and if uh, somebody else wants to take this up or reflect upon this. I mean, maybe it'll be nice. Otherwise, you can also react to it. Well, I can, this is Shuchi. I can just maybe venture yeah, sure. a comment. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of writing about this right now, you know, what we do um, with, uh, with the archives and with all of this. So um, I think in partition studies, this is a basic issue like some of the responses I have got to when I've um, sort of shared my work is okay so so much has been done already you know why would you want to do more kind of thing um, but you never ask this question about other such traumas in history whether it be the holocaust or the Rwandan you know case or apartheid in South Africa it's never done it has you have to keep doing partly because not everybody's voice is heard but also partly because I think it's a continuous process of memory generation and transmission. Um, one of the things about the partition that I had to think about uh, at length is that all these other contexts I've mentioned, there is a question of justice, that it was you know, a government or it was a small minority that was oppressing other people. In the case of the partition, there aren't any questions of justice that can be addressed because we don't have the records. It's like you know, more than 70 years after. Um, and so if you don't do it for justice, then what do you document for? And I'm still trying to think about that. You know, there is, um, I mean, there is definitely the question of uh, giving each person whose life was lost a certain dignity rather than thinking that they are just kind of, you know, eliminated on the trash heap of history. Like that's one thing, I think. Um, mm -hmm. but, but, uh, but you're right. I think this is, this is the question that I'm thinking. So the colonial archives were real documents, you know, whether they're land records or they are, you know, records of baptism and deaths and registries and so on. This oral histories are a very different kind of collection. And mm -hmm. I'm actually working with some of them and trying to figure out for myself that ultimately what is their achievement and what is their contribution? So I don't yeah. have an answer, but I do think that, um, you know, there, there are some contexts, like for instance, um, if you think about the Nanjing, um, you know, the Nanjing massacre by the Japanese army, there's nothing to be, nothing to be gained from remembering something so horrific. And yet the records are being maintained because, um, I don't know, do we, do we read history so we don't repeat those things? Do we read history because so many of the 
um, injustices do come to light, like for instance, the absolute abdication of responsibility by the British. Um, yeah. You know, so, yeah. Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting response. But uh, I was just raising a larger question of uh, uh, historical methodology because it's not just for the oral narratives that we record during the Holocaust or during partition or during periods of uh, of despair and so on. I mean, there's a whole uh, arena of um, feminist writings and Dalit studies and tribal Adivasi. Uh, cultural memories and so on and so forth, you know, and so this whole question of uh, how do we methodologically uh, understand, because these are individual experiences, right? I mean, uh, every time you talk about uh, uh, documenting these, uh, they say, oh, but this is just an individual experience. So when I say archiving of experience, I suppose I'm trying to suggest that a kind of a pattern of such experiences, not that one should forget them, uh, but to analyze the way patterns of displacement emerged. Because individual experiences, as you suggest, are like saying, why are you going to do it? Why do you want to do it? So I think that we really have to address this larger question. The particular is important, but methodologically, I think we have to come to terms with, now it's 70, 75 years after partition. So we really need to address this whole question of um, uh, uh, you know how uh, how this uh, uh, how this documentation or this because we we are from personal from personal uh, doc, uh, uh, personal papers we are making them public documents right I mean it's not like now just in the uh, it's just not the family documentation it's the public documentation so we really need to address this maybe perhaps we can um, leave this for a or a, another larger discussion on methodologies that historians and others should use. Uh, and then there was this. this yeah, yeah I sure. Was I was wondering if I could say something because yeah. I think the, um, uh, you know, on the perspective of history, we have to think of several levels of temporality, right? So, if first we could think of Parasha's work as a personal narrative things that he told us as children, uh, this is oral, it is visual, and um, revolves in a kind of a linear fashion from the beginning of the disturbances through the way those large forces impacted personal life. Second, we could think of it as a collective narrative, right? The sketches in this instance, uh, but also in the narratives from, you know, say literature or film or drama, uh, all these accounts are not linear and they revolve around individual traumatic experience which could recur and have recurred uh, in other situations again, though of course not to the same people. And the third is the nation's uh, history narrativized in events of significance such as those found in meta-hegemonic uh, accounts of history textbooks. So the first two, the personal and the collective narratives are uh, entwined and are brought to us in fragments of information loaded in memory. And this temporality then gives the past a different meaning, one hardly touched upon by the nation's history. So these are some possibilities. Yes, yes, no, certainly, certainly that's exactly uh, what one has to address because uh, we do not in the official histories of the period uh, systematically bring in these two uh, first two um, as you know, literature is considered to be a perception of the past. So also as like memory is given a kind of a low status vis-a-vis -a, -vis a written word and so on. So, I mean, the whole issue over here is not just with reference to the individual's representations, but also to the larger question of how do we factor this into a more holistic uh, representations of partition. And there's this uh, one or two small points that I wanted to bring to the table that you, you very briefly mentioned the question about children. Uh, and I was going to club this with not only uh, very few 
images of children, but also, I mean, though you did suggest that the old woman could perhaps, you know, reflect a grandmother, but the thing is that there is no no attempt, or there is it's absolutely absent that uh, personal sketches of the self or of the family or of anybody close, near and dear is there in the images. So children, I would think it's the protective gaze. I mean, you know, protection, I mean, care. I mean, all this, and therefore not to expose, except for uh, it's not a safe place or one of those except for this one very vivid image of a child, the rest of them, I don't think. And so there is something very conscious over here. Uh, and the second point I wanted to think, and maybe perhaps uh, sisters can come in and others, you know, old family structures were broken asunder. And you showed so many images of women. Many of these images of women are in new places, new bondings, obviously with sometimes with strangers. But what they left behind, uh, and, and that also applies to Dalit groups, the sweepers and others, but what they left behind were structures of power, structures of authority, structures of subservience, structures of economic sustenance where all these groups had certain roles, subservient roles, powerful roles, and so on. So all that breaks asunder. So now the whole question is that when you come to a new place, is it free of bondage? I mean, the, the images that you are showing are actually images of helplessness and so on and so forth, especially women. No? Women, women got out of patriarchal, hierarchical, zaman, zamindari households. Uh, for them, life was, even if they were elite women, was quite horrific in those kind of households. So when they come to the refugee camps, of course, there is this, uh, question of them, you know, bonding with each other, but do these new, because, you know, trust is also lost, no? Yes, trust from the good. other is also lost. So how do you, how do we, uh, how, how do we write about this, not just simply write about it in creative manner, but also write about the loss of trust. I think that this has a major bearing on the way the nation state constructs its notion of the cultural other, and the political other as well, because of this foundations of the lack of trust and the recreating of new social structures, which are not quite new because they bring in the old hierarchical uh, and uh, social structures of power and absence. <coughs> so I think that maybe I'll just throw this open and remain silent now. Uh, anybody wants to reflect on this before we wind up? Or... Yeah. I just want to say one thing, which is that I was thinking, I mean, looking at all of these images, the degree to which Excel is perhaps uh, an ethnographer and, and the position of an artist as an ethnographer in a society which is a post-conflict society or a society with the traumas it has gone through. And what does that positionality mean? Hmm. Um, and if you want to kind of think about a method to kind of understand his work, um, the, I think of the discipline visual anthropology today, right? Where anthropologists might say make films or other ways to try and kind of understand um, human society, then culture, then processes, and the ways in which then as almost a visual anthropologist, as an ethnographer, uh, SL is kind of looking at this with a certain with deep empathy, with deep kind of uh, understanding, and then using the language of pencil sketches and things to render this. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you're absolutely right. I see him as this uh, ethnographer walking around in the camp and uh, documenting um, why we don't know, but he's documenting. Right. He's but like I'm the, thinking, uh, sure, and I'm thinking of him then vis-a-vis -vis, say somebody like MS Randhava, who he must have known, oh, yeah. I assume, kind of in many contexts. But Randhava also, you know, had this deep interest in art, of course, was an administrator. He was actually an administrator with an interest in art, an SL, an artist who became an administrator, so kind of an inverse situation. But Randhava went about kind of recording the genealogies of different artists' families just after partition um, and tracking down kind of artists in 
um, the Shimla Hills, but also in different refugee camps. And then asking them, tell me about your Dadaji and your Nanaji and so forth, and recording these things. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking that in a way, SL's project is a similar project where he's somehow trying to reconstruct kind of these lives that are otherwise just going to kind of disappear and kind of families that are anyway kind of broken and shattered, trying to piece them together in some way. Um, but to put this into kind of dialogue with perhaps somebody like Randhava. Yeah, yeah. They were very, they were, they knew each other very well. Okay. Um, yeah, Nachiket, uh, one of the things then is for the pedagogy of uh, bringing in partition studies into the school uh, curricula and also uh, making it an integral part of, uh, of uh, teacher training programs and all. I suppose um, historians have to then uh, adopt a multidisciplinary approach. And so it would have to be visual anthropology, art history, uh, and of course, of course, the historical method and and so on and so forth. And to some extent, even uh, a knowledge about um, sociology, how lineage patterns replicate themselves in uh, displaced and transformative situations and so on and so forth. So I think that uh, rather than looking at this as only a historical project, it would have to become a multidisciplinary project and maybe perhaps several as you pointed out, Randhava, but there are many other artists whose works also uh, we can look at or we can address. And then that becomes, um, just as Megha and uh, her group have looked at literature and literary perceptions and poetry uh, in a similar way, maybe the different artists, how they have uh, represented. uh, But nonetheless, these are experiences. Uh, We are talking about uh, not documentation in a very hard co hard in I, mean, I, I think Najiket somewhere you've written hard co inscriptional evidence vis-a-vis the soft uh, so-called experiential evidence uh, and this is something that historians fear to use in their narratives they fear to use in their narratives because they say there are multiple memories right and therefore we can't have a unilinear uh, the nation state wants a unilinear uh, kind of narrativization, whereas um, the society that was breaking asunder was like a much more pre-modern and pre, pre-nation state kind of uh, society. Right. So, Megha? Yes. What do you? Um, well, it, it's all these, all these various uh, aspects that you've uh, uh, Put on the table are extremely fascinating. Um, a couple of things that uh, came to my mind is a you know uh, you're very right in how historians want to look at the documentation of history and the teaching of history and how nation state uh, wants uh, history to be taught. But to me it seems like one of the things that we've all been lately especially you know when you look at um, current situations around you when, we, you look, when you look at the kind of othering that one sees, not just in our country, but all over the world. And it makes you question whether, you know, one of the, uh, one of the important aspects of education on the whole and history education, do we want to bring in um, empathy in our young minds? And if that is what we want to do, then is it only hard documentation that we want to use when we are teaching history? Because it's the human stories that make all the difference, right? And uh, the other thing that comes to my mind is when, you know, when, we're, when, when I was listening to all of you talking about uh, what he was doing and why he was doing it, and the one thought that kept creeping into my mind was perhaps this was the way of dealing with trauma and there was no other thought or, Absolutely. you know, uh, or aim or purpose. Just as a lot of people write when they are going through extreme tr- trauma. So for somebody with an artistic bent, this is the outlet. But whatever it is, what a wealth he has left behind. And we really need to do something about it uh, in terms of, I would say, my own selfish interests 
of bringing it into schools. Mm -hmm. that, that is our selfish interest too, Megha. Wonderful. Um, but, yeah, we did not, I mean, there have been so, so often we've had people who've wanted to buy one or 10 or five and we have not sold the collection because we think it is public, it is for the public. Uh, it must be seen by the younger generation. It must be remembered because I'm often uh, uh, reminded of uh, what my, my mother's words, because she uh, said, you're asking me to remember what I've taken an entire lifetime to forget. It's that forgetting that cannot happen. Sure. And so I really do, uh, along with you, think that, yes, he had the pencil in his hand. He's the artist who... Uh, clearly was writing or imaging his own trauma as he walked around the camp. And I think he did mention to uh, Justine the major that, you know, he'd walk around in the camps at night and he used a Punjabi phrase, Dukhada Pahar, you know, right. he wanted to, you know, it, it's so beautifully, it, it sounds so beautiful in Punjabi that I can't trans that I think in translation, it just doesn't carry the same weight. Sure. But yeah. that's why he did it. You're absolutely right. And it's fascinating that when you look at the sketches, there's a certain softness. You know, that the lines are so beautiful, so strong with the way they flow, but yet you see a certain softness, uh, which I find and, and I, amazing. I, I only showed, yeah, I only showed a few. There are so many more. Yes. There are so many more. Actually, if you're ever in Delhi, any one of you, mm -hmm. um, our home has been, uh, you know, our, uh, um, uh, our brother, Raju Parasha, and um, um, our sisters, Bela and Shoba, would be very happy to show you the gallery that houses not only the partitions, um, uh, sketches and line, line drawings, but also drawings of the hills, the Shimla hills and the aftermath. You know, you can see the way in which the, you know, the textures and lines continue into the 50s and 60s. So clearly, so, the gallery. So, clearly, so clearly the lines continuing into the 50s and 60s was an effort on his part to see a modern nation state that would be equally empathizing with each other and living in harmony and all that, right? But the actual event, the actual process of displacement had actually created st uh, strictures of distance, non-trust, rebellious behavior towards the other, conflict, hierarchical impositions, you know all kinds of things. So, 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 so the artist is carrying a narrative which is uh, thing. So, so Megha, what do we teach the children? We have to teach the children both, no? Absolutely. Because they won't be able to. They won't be able to handle the present. Yes. They won't be able to handle the present because they'll say, "Where did this present come from?" True. Which is so aggressive. Yes, it's it's very important uh, uh, to teach both. Mm -hmm. No denying that. So Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, visit. Rajna, Aloka, both of you. This has been really, really yeah. wonderful. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, I just realized that there were some comments, but we forgot to look at chat. But never uh, mind. But yeah. Yeah. You, can take, you can take a look at the chat. No, it's from Nachiket, and he spoke so beautifully. So, um, is there a question, Nachiket? I was just delighted to have a chance to participate. Thank you. It was really kind of. Oh, I really hope we can. I hope we can stay in touch. Absolutely. Since you're in Michigan and I'm in Pennsylvania. Yeah, but he's in touch with Hyderabad already, so you don't have to be in the U.S. to be in touch. All right. <laughs> well, Hyderabad doesn't mean Pittsburgh. <laughs> 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 and, and then I think yeah. Steve Hopkins. Uh, okay, all right. So, oh, you're a documentary maker, Steve. I'm also an Can I just say something? Um, I have Steve. something that I would like to sort of bring to the table. Um, sure. I was thinking about um, the work that we saw, and I was thinking that it was a work 
that came with the nation state, you know, all of the birth of the nation state and the response of an artist. And I was thinking that this was the same time and I'm picking up on what Shuchi had asked about why do we document and what Aloka ji said about why now. And I was thinking that this was the same time, historically speaking, when the nation state is looking at Emperor Ashoka and adopting the Ashokan symbol. Uh, we're looking back at his inscriptions and I'm thinking about the Shaibaz Ganj inscription where Ashoka expresses remorse for what happened. And if, in that inscription that you know one can use to, to go back to what uh, Siegel wants to do as a pedagogical moment, to say that here was a moment where Ashoka is establishing the foundation for a new nation state. And he's looking at you know, what happened on the war. And it's an incredible moment where um, Victor is expressing remorse in his own personal voice. So that inscription at Shehbaz Ganj especially is when he is speaking as a person, as a witness to the horrors. And he's in that moment where he's establishing a new nation state and a foundation for a new nation state. So to link what Asho, uh, Aloka ji was talking about, being aware of that violence and then seeking remorse and then a foundation of empathy and compassion and a Buddhist kind of a world. So, you know, this is that same 1950s moment where it's that why we have adopted Ashoka as the possibility of reconciliation of the outsider. And in that Shaibaz Ganj inscription, even if you read it carefully, he's talking about the tribals, he's talking about the Mechas, he's talking about the outsiders and trying to incorporate even them into the nation state. And that sense of hierarchy that even at the moment of his remorse, he's aware of the difference, he's aware of the outsider status. And so it doesn't allow for a simple reconciliation or a simple linearity those hierarchies are existent even in his mind because it's still too soon he hasn't yet processed it but you know those are moments where pedagogically to say like how did this nation state historically deal with remorse how did it historically deal and in a way you know those can be historicized uh, when we are historicizing a voice where we are talking about other moments of history where art history and inscriptional evidence and like you're talking about uh, written inscriptions as oral records can be sort of done with a little more methodological rigor or uh, you know when we read now to sort of read through that lens or through that um, perspective and maybe we'll get new voices and new methodologies from just rereading those same inscriptions. Kirtana, that was wonderful. Yes. Um, that Shahabas guard inscription actually also asserts Kirtana that um, even though uh, he's expressing remorse, uh, he's still strong. That's what I'm saying. He hasn't yet reached that reconciliation. Yeah, exactly. And that moment where, you know, the, the voices are not easily reconcilable, mm -hmm. where his own thoughts, he hasn't yet forgotten that he has criminalize them and he, that he has mm -hmm. multiple values in his own kingdom for multiple, you know, it's not, so that sense of um, not an easy reconciliation, that those complexities, that those uh, irreconcilabilities yeah. are okay. part of those fragmentary, you know, non-linear, they refuse to sort of fall into those um, yeah, that's a, that's a very, this complexity of the many voices, yeah. I think yes. there was another, uh, there was another presentation when we had on Amrita Pritham and the whole question of the, um, 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 the Rekha was telling us about the about uh, many close relatives who were now talking about um, actually having beheaded their children or killed them uh, even before they migrated out because they didn't want the I mean and and these aunts of hers were just explaining all that yes. now there yeah. are there are these very different ways of handling uh, this traumatic event and so uh, how do these people reconcile right. to the creation of yes. a yeah. modern nation state which is uh, which can't be soft all around yes. I mean it can yes. talk about a possible reconciliation but the people yes. uh, would have to continue it would take a long time for them to accept uh, and I'm here not talking simply about the other as what uh, they left behind or something like that, but the entire the entire discourse 
yes. of how do you, uh, yeah, how do you look at, uh, uh, how do you live, uh, uh, how do you uh, create a future uh, in a, a more inclusive future, let's put it like that. And so that was also the task that the nation state had to go through. Um, and we, we know the trajectory of how that happened. And until now, there are large sections of population left out of the master narrative of the nation state. Right. right. <laughs> and, and, and I'm just saying that that's probably why that Sheba's Ganj inscription is a particularly important pedagogical tool, because where he then starts by saying not only have i hurt or not only the victims are not only those who have been killed in the war but the people of the families who have been left behind of those who died on the battlefield then he extends that to say the friends of those whose relatives were victims of those who died on the battlefield so he keeps you know starting from that center and he moves outward in that you know one it's a concentric sense of how the ripples of war go from the battlefield and go way beyond that battlefield to touch all of the families, the friends of the families, the relatives, the extensions, and that rippling effect of violence, that rippling effect of remorse um, it could be a pedagogical moment to say like across history, this is the kind of, uh, in the Indian context, apart from you know what happens in Cambodia, the killing fields and the Holocaust Museum, within India itself, we have moments of you know how we were dressed hmm. yeah yeah there are, there are but there is also a very conscious forgetting of violence i mean not only within the mainstream indian uh, textual traditions but also within uh, adivasi societies and others there's only only particular moments of violence that are remembered I mean, uh, Ashish Nandi has written a lot about this as to why uh, why there is a why is violence not remembered uh, significantly um, or, or in a more marked manner than it is in other societies? I mean, that's of course a topic for another day, but uh, the, the, we have to take into account this whole, well, why do people want to forget violence uh, and not remember it uh, in this pointed way and not document it, not write about it, not uh, give specific references to what happened when, etc. I mean, this is something that has to do with the way we look at history, the way we we as a society look at history. Chalo, now I think uh, we'll uh, thank you, Kirtana. That was a really very insightful uh, point that you raised. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you, Megha. <laughs> For thank you. this thank you. opportunity, thank you. Uh, to uh, both of you. Wonderful to be with all of you. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Very much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Is that Frida? Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. I saw Frida there. Yeah. Okay, then bye. bye. I'm unable to leave. <laughs> I, will, I will end. <laughs> you know, something's happened to my Zoom. It didn't let me join and now it's not letting me leave. I don't know what to do. I think I, I have to load this Zoom again. <laughs> anyway, uh, you all better get out and then I'll just close. <laughs> all right, bye. Have a bye. session. Bye. Bye.